Yes, I'm going to talk. I'm actually going to give you a report from the field. And uh, someone described it that way because I am not a classic professor or a scholar. I was a supply chain manager for 20 years of my career. I am trained as an engineer. I'm not an economist and I'm not a political scientist. Um, I'm trained in um, solving technical problems. I've been trained as an engineer at MIT, which is a technical university. And I spent um, 20 years in industry designing supply chains, deciding where factories will be placed, deciding where uh, material will be bought, deciding who will sell it, who will move it, uh, at what price. Not me. Per not me personally making every single one of these micro decisions because there are thousands and thousands. And the configurations change from day to day to day uh, because as, uh, as my colleague uh, observed, we are in a highly dynamic world in which um, the relationships are totally changing. Um, I'm not going to talk about power consequently because that's not the angle uh, from which I look at it, and that was not what motivated our personal behavior. I'm going to try and give you some, some insight into, into the actions that ordinary managers and engineers took to create the world that we live in today. Um, the structure of my talk is to understand globalization from a supply chain perspective, and I will use that term because I find, find it useful. I also find it more specific than talking about value chains, and I find it more personally more useful than talking about production chains because it's much more than manufacturing. It's much more than actually just assembling a product and there are many, many supply chains that have nothing to do with material flows. Okay, but the principles of systems dynamics apply. So I have only 15 minutes, so forgive me if it will be very, very quick. I will try and give you as many practical examples as I possibly can to illustrate the points that I'm about to make. And so what I will do is I will try and give you perspectives from the various stakeholders. And sta by stakeholders, I mean the decision makers and also the people who bear the consequences of these decisions at, a, at an economic level, at a political level, at a power level, I will try and differentiate those things. So, but there are many, many people involved in these complex systems that have become more global and more fragmented. Um, I'm going to talk, I'm going to keep the technical details to minimum, although I'm glad to provide you with all of the math and all of the technical logic afterwards. I'm going to talk about the perception of these systems in the public eye, especially in the political perception, and that, that in my opinion, are dangerously influencing uh, what we think of, uh, of political economy and what we think of uh, what managers and companies should be doing. Um, there are narratives of villainy that, that come out of this. Um, there's all sorts of xenophobic uh, uh, rhetoric that comes up. There's a sense of, of loss and of gain and of threat and at risk. I'd like to put it into sort of a technical format so that you can imagine what ordinary managers um, are doing here and, and uh, hopefully uh, some of their uh, intentions. So it will not be aggregated at the, the level of national economic data. I'm going to disaggregate the discussion down to ordinary people. So I hope that will be interesting for you. So I'm going to ask what are the real and imagined consequences of global trade, of globalization today, of, of dividing labor between companies. Um, I'll talk about the fact that manufacturing has become the focus of our attention and the focus of our discussion. It has become the agenda over which we quarrel and the subject of very, very loud political uh, debate all over the world, especially in the US and the UK, meaning in the Anglophone countries, but obviously of, of burning interest uh, to the emerging economies. And with that, I include Eastern Europe and Asia. So. I will ask you a rhetorical question because I find that the logic behind uh, the way we look at things is that everybody thinks that you are competing on cost. You as a nation, you as a company, you as a person. Okay, I will challenge that and I will tell you that that is simply not true. There are other factors that determine your competitiveness and your ability to win, your ability to contribute to the global system 
your ability to benefit from it. And if you oversimplify the logic, you will actually, you might well undermine the robustness of your system. And I'll try and show that to you. 15 minutes is too short, but I will give you a very rough idea of why I believe, and I happen to know based on experience, why that is the case. Uh, very, very briefly, to spare you the agony, I will show you the hidden science of supply chain systems. There is a technical logic behind this. It comes out of uh, operations research. It comes out of a research area. And there have been generations of scientists and engineers like myself personally who have made these decisions based on, on not just an economic lo logic and not on a logic of power. That might be our, our weakness as engineers, that we don't think in these categories very, in a very savvy or, or conscious way. But I'll talk to you about simply the technical and the, and the engineering logic that goes behind deciding where to buy, where to make, who to make it with, at what cost, at what price, because price and cost are not the same thing at what quality, at what speed, at what distance, in which region. OK, I'll talk about that scientifically. And then I will conclude my, my presentation to you with what, what policymakers, and that includes government, but is not, is not only about government, but policymakers and other stakeholders can do to help uh, your region become more prosperous and participate in these systems to your advantage and not necessarily to everybody else's disadvantage. Um, one of the things I'd like to say is that a lot of what I will show you t today is hidden. It is not reported in the newspapers um, and it's not a zero-sum game. So I hope that knowledge will make you more sophisticated in your judgment of these things and I hope it will make all of us uh, better citizens. So uh, to my, that was, uh, what you will hear from me. Th I wanted to say, we talk about supply chains, we talk about them, we reduce them more and more and more uh, to manufacturing systems. And so this is probably the type of picture that many of us have in our minds when we talk about globalization. And we see, we see and this is um, the Canadian photographic artist, Edward Bratinsky, who has, who has um, done outstanding um, sort of uh, narrative and, and documentary work on industrial systems around the world. This is a real picture of a Chinese factory. He, he published a book on China. And this is part of the anxieties that we have, that, that our societies will be changed, we will be, become machines, that the scale will overwhelm us, and that certainly countries like China and India, maybe Russia, maybe Czech, others will take away jobs, will dominate us and that we will lose our autonomy and our ability to be prosperous. Um, I personally, in, uh, what should I say, 25 years of working um, in industry and now in university studying what we did, I'm convinced that it's not about threat. I'm convinced it's about doing the right thing and I've seen a very positive development in poverty alleviation and democracy around the world, and certainly in the 26 years since I have arrived in Central Europe, thanks to countries like the Czech Republic, by the way. So, um, it's nothing new that's happening here. Yes, the world has changed completely, but it's quite clear, even in 1748, economists knew that manufacturing and economic activity moves from place to place and that there are, there are comparative advantages and disadvantages and that economic logic takes us to those locations where value can be added um, in the most efficient way to the, to the best of everybody's ability and hopefully somebody will want to buy it. So what we are seeing here is not new in its essence. In its specifics, it is quite new, yes. So I'm going to um, show you that clearly things that you know, but I think it's interesting to bring the, the pictures in front of our eyes. I will emphasize the fact that we have an unprecedented division of labor across the nations today. So it takes, um, it takes many regions and many countries to make a laptop. And this is quite an old picture from, from uh, the Wall Street Journal. So it's 10 years old. If it was designed in the US, it went over to China and then it came back. 
um, that complexity has increased. And uh, this is the sort of thing you will occasionally see in the press. Um, I remember a very, very um, critical article in the German uh, newspaper, the Die Zeit, where they asked rhetorically, why does it take uh, five nations to build one, one razor, one electronic razor? So, um, so it actually seems like some sort of uh, irresponsible, wanton chasing of profit across borders. I would argue that that is not the case. It's about specialization. It's about division of labor. It's about new economies and new people providing their talent so they can cr contribute to better and better products. And uh, I'll try and, and illustrate uh, how we all personally as consumers benefit from that. So uh, it's no more made in Czech Republic. There's nothing that's just made in Germany anymore. There's nothing that's just made in the US anymore, whether or not you manufacture uh, there. This is actually a, a picture from Li and Fung, which is the, the coordinating um, company in Hong Kong. Uh, two brothers, MIT and Harvard uh, trained, went back to their trading company and created basically um, a, a database in which the best people are, are kept. Basically, they are able to qualify and say, who's the best at making zippers? Who's the best at making plastic shells? Who's the best at, at sewing it together? Who's the best? And since I know these brothers, I know that they, they not only looking for the lowest price and the cheapest, 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 they said, who can do it best? Who can do it fastest? Who can do it reliably? Because cheap will not help me if the goods never arrive. Cheap will not help me if it rips, and then I have a recall, or I have, and, and the goods, and I lose my my brand uh, equity as a result like that. But because we divide labor and we are able to contribute our talent and our hard work, manufacturing has no more borders. This is a cause of deep anxiety. So doesn't have to be. The consequences of this is that you and I personally and our children now have unprecedented access to cheaper goods. If Germany were to make television sets in Germany, they would cost upwards of 10,000 euro and would not necessarily be better. What that means in terms of, of social uh, equality is that uh, an, an un an, a non-university educated professor, meaning a, a skilled laborer can afford a television set, can afford a smartphone, their children can afford PCs and, and gain access to the information economy. So I'm trying to emphasize to you that global supply chains not only have poverty alleviating effects which have been measured in, in the emerging economies, but they directly impact our lives and make us more prosperous. So let's not forget that. The longer technology is around, the more expert our supply chains become at doing what they do, the cheaper these products get for us because we waste less resources and we, we get smarter and smarter at what we do. We actually improve the processes. And if you read the uh, management um, research that is done in business schools, these are well captured in case studies. Um, this knowledge has progressed immensely. It is not kept exclusively now through um, courses online. Any of your companies can access these best practices. And people like me have published them. So in spite of the, the optimistic picture I'm trying to show you, there is a general perception in the public and often at universities and you know, a general uh, sense of threat that there are not just winners in this game, but that there are losers. And this I'll just go over quickly. We get the feeling uh, in the huge debate right now in the US about deindustrialization. Without manufacturing, communities become poor. And we knew that. If you go to one of the mono towns in, in Russia, you know that that is a fact. And you blame it on their, their political system. But look at what's happening in the US. This is Detroit. Okay. With manufacturing, at this, if we lose manufacturing, we become poor. But if we get it, we become slaves. Whoa, horrible. The woman who nearly died making your iPad. So incredible amount of, um, yes, negative press in both directions. Fairly illogical, because you can't have both. So, and the latest scandal was Primark. For those who follow it, Primark, for, there were apparently um, uh, notes sewn into the, into the clothes saying, SOS, help me, I'm a slave. Um, 
there, I can recommend a very good book to everybody by Pietra Rivoli at Georgetown University. She's, a, she's an economist, not a supply chain engineer like myself, who wrote a book called The Travels of a T-Shirt Through the Global Economy and tried to explain what the biography of a simple product can contribute to current debates over global trade. And the reason it's worth reading this book is because of all the surprises she experienced. She started off with the same point and she said she heard an activist on the Georgetown campus saying, who made your T-shirt? Very tendentious rhetorical question. Was it a child in Vietnam chained to a sewing machine without food or water? Or a young girl from India earning 18 cents per hour and allowed to visit the bathroom only twice uh, per day, and so on and so forth. So the perception that manufacturing jobs are the equivalent of, of inhuman exploitation of labor persists. And these on the campuses of the US. So Professor Rivoli questioned this and went to the to the factories, very interesting. At the same time, and I'll get back to, you, to her conclusions, at the same time we see economic data from The Economist, for example, saying that the effects of industrialization and urbanization has actually had an impact on uh, suicidal rates, which are much higher in the agricultural parts of the country where people do not just work 12 hours a day at the Foxconn factory, but they never stop working. And there's no regulation of child labor, and there's nowhere to sleep, and there's not regular food or water either. Okay, that is the alternative for them, and that the suicide rate goes down when they come into the factory, strangely enough. The Economist is the, the source here, and it was very recent. Um, and Professor Rivoli said when she studied the industrial revolutions of the world and saw how societies changed as a result of manufacturing moving to these places, one of the surprising conclusions that she came to is that one of its most significant legacies was the liberation of women, which I find very important. I have to stop? Mind the time. Excuse me, I'll have to, I'll have to speed through it. Manufacturing um, also is an empowering. study that I can recommend remains um, in the US a key finding of the study is that bringing back high volume electronics will not be the path to good jobs or economic growth because the, the the lion's share of the value is in the US in spite of global value chains the money goes back to the US this is the example of the iPad and the red is the proportion so do supply chains have to be cheap to be successful no, this is an argument I will bring to the Czech Republic, even though our, we imagine big business to be successful, big business like this, including Microsoft, which is important. There are hidden champions that manage to have expensive operations and expensive supply chains in expensive parts of the world, like Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, and they are hidden, and they are, they are part of the of the plumbing of materials flow that goes on in all of our lives. We don't know them, but they are making a lot of money. This is one possible model for the Czech Republic. 
Okay, and these are their strategies that go beyond the lowest wage. And this is my argument of why it's more than manufacturing, it's more than cost. They are ultra niche, they have specialized in something that only they can do. They trade between businesses and not necessarily to consumers. They are globally selling so that when Germany cannot buy, somebody in China or Brazil will be able to cover their costs. They have an enormous innovative potential and activity with an attention to detail. Their quality cannot be substituted by any other worker in the world. They have a collaborative workforce with high quality jobs, highly paid, and as a result today there's a talent shortage in Germany. There, is, there are too few skilled workers, and I'm not talking about university educated people, skilled workers to do the job and so on. And with this, they are able to maintain manufacturing in the company without political intervention. So I will not go through national varieties of capitalism, but the context that you provide for your business determines how su successful they can be. You can look at this later and look up the source in the book. So the US is very much about immediate exploitation and making a buck now. If you think in terms of systems and long term, you will stand a better chance, in my opinion. Um, as a result, um, this is a study that was published last year by Fraunhofer Institute. The, the very minimum wave of outsourcing into the rest of the world in Germany is turning back. And they're saying that the most important regions for for collaborative production for German companies are in the EU states, meaning close by, and for allem in Osteuropa, meaning definitely here. Okay, it's an engineering decision. It's not just politics, it's not just, uh, you cannot order someone to be successful in a certain location. You can't just put a factory there and just give everybody jobs and hope it will work. All of our outsourcing decisions were made objectively, not privileging any location. If we hadn't made the decisions we made according to objective criteria, we wouldn't have been doing our jobs. And this is the, uh, the manufacturing VP of Hewlett Packard, who is my, was my boss. So I, I, I will not go into an interview with him in which he explains how he outsourced to Singapore and it wasn't about cost. So this is what what supply chains are. And if, this is a highly oversimplified picture. The average supply chain is much more complex. So you have these stakeholders. You will have component suppliers. You have, will have uh, people who transport your goods. You will have contract manufacturers. You will have distributors, retailers, and consumers. And these are the stakeholders. These are the people who have something to gain or lose depending on how well everybody does their jobs. It cannot be ordered to behave or be in a certain way. So, the real criteria for our decisions were these four, and cheap is the number four. So you decide where to do business or, or, or move your operations, you can because of political decisions. Brazil says you can only sell in Brazil if you have factories there, I'll leave, sorry. Um, China uh, imposes a lot of, uh, of criteria. This is not long-term way to be competitive. Um, but that is one reason to decide where your factories will be. They can be better because you're just better at making something than other people. And in, in Germany, a uh, long history of training and experience has made them better at, at, at heavy machinery. Tax regimes make a huge difference and much bigger than any that, uh, that you would think. But the, the unit labor cost is the least important. Okay, I will skip this. So, I will conclude by saying that these are some of the criteria you will have to balance to make a good competitive supply chain, and a good competitive supply chain is more than a good competitive nation. But the nation and the region is part of it and can, and can work to reduce the expenses that are at play to increase the revenues and, and an engineer will try to make the best of their capacity at the lowest inventory. You have to spend money to make money. So if your location can help you reduce the amount of money it costs to do business and do your work here, you will come out ahead. And in this way, your policymakers and your infrastructure can help. So I guess I will conclude with this picture. 
Which supply chain requires less inventory and less cost? Can you look at this? Can any of you dare to make a decision here? Is it clear to you, if you were to make a political decision and say which one is most competitive, would you know how to decide? Okay? The answer is you cannot look at it and know. There are over $2 million difference in the cost of these two supply chains, and it depends on how fast goods move through it, how reliable suppliers are, not just how expensive the workers are or where the factory is located. The location of the factory will determine how long it takes for materials to flow. But what I want to leave this audience with is that you make the wrong political decision. You will burden your supply chains with massive cost. You will make your economies less competitive. So make sure you bring in the engineers and involve rational decision making. The consequences are political, but political inter intervention reduces your competitiveness unless your politicians are well trained in the mathematics of this. This is how you do it. So call me. So. Thank you, Bibi. Let me just leave this up here. I, uh, I can't give you the whole lesson here. Thomas has heard it in a week here. Um, the, I'm giving you examples of, of companies that, that have succeeded. This is, these are some of the things you can do when you're settling, when you're setting policy. Remember that it's not a zero-sum game. A, convergen, a convergence on one country or region is not inevitable. It doesn't have to all go to China or India. Our anxieties are such, but it's not true. There are hidden costs and unintended consequences of short-term op optimization and single factor solutions. And remember, expensive models can be competitive. Read this, but I guess what I wish for you as the Czech Republic, which I have admired in the 26 years I have been here and seen the role you have played in Europe, I wish for you that you will find your national business model, you will educate your policymakers and collaborate to succeed. Because it's not nations who compete against nations, it's supply chains who compete, about, compete with supply chains. So the skills you will need to succeed in the global uh, economy in the future will be, will be very, very high level. And I think you can do it. <laughs>